to finish this in a lesson in science. Now, scientifically speaking, a lot of Christians have a hard time defending their faith. And they think that science and Christianity really conflict with each other. And today what I want to show you is that science proves that God is the God above all gods, is going to prove to you beyond all doubt so that you can articulate it to people how great he really is. And hopefully by the time we're done today, you'll walk away without any doubt in your mind that you can defend yourself in front of somebody else. Now, before we get going, this is not going to be completely exhaustive. We don't have time. If you enjoy this, though, let me know because we're thinking about actually doing a class series on how to defend your faith taught by my beautiful wife, where she'll be actually taking, she was a math and science teacher in the public system, so we'll be able to, to go through and actually show you that. All right, creation versus evolution. There has been an assault on our children. We started recognizing this when we were teaching Dominic his science courses, recognizing that the theory of evolution, the theory of evolution, was taught as fact. And a lot of bad science was used in the process of this. But we see movies coming out, like Jurassic Park, that talk about evolution. We hear about it, whether it being uh, on television all the time. You see it in some of the science world. But... The assault has taken place on the children because if they can change the mindset of children, young people, students, then they can actually control the entire state. We've been brainwashing our children that they're nothing more than evolved animals. You're nothing more than a monkey that's grown. And because we've taught our young children that they're nothing more than an evolved animal, we should not be shocked when they behave like animals. Are you with me? When you tell somebody that they're bad long enough, they'll believe they're bad. If you tell somebody long enough that they're stupid, they'll start believing they're stupid. You tell somebody that they're great, they'll start believing it. Are you with me? Yes. You tell somebody you're an animal long enough, do not be shocked when you start seeing the riots that are taking place in the news. It all goes back to something that Hitler knew very well. Hitler said, let me control the textbooks and I will control the state. And if you have not paid attention to your children's textbooks lately, I highly encourage you, grab your children's books, grab your grandchildren's books, and see what they are indoctrinating your young people with. This is so integrated into the church itself that Gallup did a poll in 2012. Well, let's take a look at some of these numbers. 46% of those in the Gallup poll believe that God created humans in their present form. However, 32% of Americans believe that God guided evolution. That's very critical to understand because that number has actually moved its way into the church where people actually believe that God created all things, but, it, but uh, he used evolution. Whereas 14% believe that it was all just random. There is no God, there is no creator, there is no design. If you look at it, those numbers are exactly the same, which is kind of weird because it means that somebody didn't vote. But it's 46 and 46. This assault has been taking place because they've been bombarding us with the Big Bang and evolution. However, recently, there has been a lot of, of the Big Bang theory and evolution coming under fire. A lot of people are questioning it because science is really having a difficult time trying to prove evolution in any way. Hear what I'm saying. And now it's not only Christians who are pushing back, but we're also finding a weird sector of people now trying to promote something called design. Anybody hear about that? So they may not say God created, but something created with design. And this is one of the most famous ones. Has anybody watched that show, Ancient Aliens? Major movement right now saying that we didn't just happen. There's nothing that says that we just spontaneously evolved over the years. Maybe aliens did it. What's weird is that they're getting the most vocal. Now, although we don't believe aliens did this, it is funny, though. The church is still remaining silent, and all these alien hunters 
are fighting that God, or that a God, that they, we call God, really just being some alien form, created and modified human beings. Let's go into this. Time Magazine, a while ago, uh, had an article saying how life began. And one of the contributors, Mark Green, said, forget bubbles, comets, or ocean vents. Scientists should be looking at pizza for the answer. I can remember when my college roommates and I routinely created life every week in our refrigerator. My theory is that about 4.5 billion years ago, the Earth was bombarded by intergalactic pizzas. These then provided the ideal breeding ground in which early organisms could thrive and later evolve. Basically, he's making fun as a scientist of what they say. And you can see how both lines in this cartoon try to teach children that they're nothing more than random mistake. How it formed from a single protozoa to round worms and insects and lobsters and fish and eventually the human being. The truth is, as I've said earlier, there is a lot about the Big Bang Theory that is being attacked right now. So our opinion is, why don't we just teach the controversy? If we can't come in and actually uh, stop and change the curriculum, we should at least be able to teach our children how to defend themselves. And if they have to get a grade, at least they can get a grade discussing the controversy itself. Some of the headlines in recent publications have been, The, the Big Bang Theory Goes Kerplooey. The Big Bang Theory Explodes. Sorry, Big Bang Theory is a dud. All these different things are attacking the Big Bang Theory. So let's talk about what it actually is for those who haven't been in science class for a while. Basically, what scientists believe in this Big Bang Theory is that the universe originated billions of years ago with an explosion from a single point of nearly infinite density. Something triggered an explosion which they figure 13.8 billion years ago, and from that, all life randomly began. What's unusual about this date is this is the date, 13.8 billion, is what they say is the origins or the origination date of our universe. What happened before that, nobody really knows. They're just going to start it there, and that's where science has a problem. Eventually, they still come to the same faith questions that we have. So let's talk about evolution then. If everything started from the Big Bang and evolved from gases, eventually formed single cell organisms and evolved over time, what is evolution? It was really put to, uh, on the forefront by a gentleman by the name of Darwin. You may have heard of him before. And his general theory is that everything has a common ancestor. Frogs and fish, birds, bananas, flowers, they all have the same ancestor. And through the development of uh, purely undirected there, uh, modifications, there was uh, advancement into the lives that we have now. Mutations occurred in the genetic code through what we call natural selection, and therefore something new was created. This was the best picture that I found for Darwin and his evolution. Now, right off the bat, I want to say this. Science and the Bible are not in conflict. Let me say this again. Science and the Bible are not conflicting. They both have conclusions, which are sometimes biased going into it, but we have to have an honest evaluation of the facts. There are thousands of Christians who are scientists that believe in the evidence in creation. Unfortunately, because most of the media is not Christian-based, they do not get the same publicity as do the atheist scientists. We do have friends, though, that are rocket scientists working in NASA, and they'll tell you that the higher you get and climb in NASA, the more Christians there are. They said entry-level NASA scientists are about 90% uh, atheist, 10% Christian. By the time they've been there, any length, of advancement promotion in time, it flips itself. And 90% of the high working scientists are Christians and 10% are atheists. It must be because of some of the evidence that they have been finding. Hugh Ross is a Christian astrophysicist and he earned his PhD in astronomy and he said, the work of secular scientists is the friend, not foe, of Christians. 
Their efforts have given us some of the strongest evidences for our Creator, God, and Savior. I love what the Bible says. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display His craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make known Him. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. Psalm 19, 1 through 6. The stars are a giant billboard declaring the glory of God. They declare how big and awesome He really is. He is bigger and He is greater than everything that you ever thought or imagined. Genesis 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered over the deep waters. And the Spirit of God hovering over the surface of the waters... Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. When God spoke, everything happened, and I guess you could say there was a big bang. God spoke, and bang, it was created. He said, let there be light, and light came from his mouth, shooting at 186,282 miles per second. The, <laughs> I love that. He gets what he wants because he's God. And the universe declares how massive and how big he really is. And that's just the known universe. We don't even really know what's out there. Sometimes you think something may be looking back at you. The bigger the telescope and the deeper that we look, we just keep finding more and more amazing things. It's as if God is saying, keep on looking and see just how awesome I have created things. I've got stuff out here that will blow your mind. Doesn't that look like a big eye? Sometimes it feels like somebody's watching me. That is a real picture. We pulled these off NASA sites, just so you know. Scientists are stumped because they've heard, they've had a hard time grasping that we can only be the only planet that has life. But what if the universe wasn't created to have life on other planets? What if the universe was just created to show how big and awesome God really is? Let's take a look at the constellation Pleiades. This constellation is about 440 light years out, yet Job knew about it. He writes in Job 38, 31 to 33, Can you direct the movement of the stars? Binding the cluster of the Pleiades or loosening the cords of Orion. Can you direct the sequence of the seasons or guide the bear with her cubs across the heavens? Do you know the laws of the universe? Can you use them to regulate the earth? Isaiah said, Who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? This is going to be a lot of fun. What you're going to look at now is called the Vela Pulsar. It is 1,000 light years out. It is a highly magnetized neutron star that is oscillating at 11 revolutions per second. And you think, well, that's not that much. You try oscillating on your axis 11 times per second. Not an easy thing to do, especially for a star. But I want you to listen to what this sounds like. Let's go ahead and play that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him from the skies. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all the armies of heaven. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you twinkling stars. Praise Him, skies above. Praise Him, vapors high above the clouds. Let everything that's created give praise to the Lord. For He issued His command and they came into being. He set them in place forever and ever. His decree will never be revoked. 
Psalm 148. It does sound like Oscar on the drums. This is a fun one. This is known really as a cluster of stars called 47 Tuck. It's 16,700 light years away. And what this is, you can't count them all, but it's 23 millisecond pulsars. And we recorded 16 of these pulsars. I think you might like this. Let's play the pulsars. star frequency that is given. By the way, that's how they trace stars in the sky, by their frequencies. Okay? Psalm 8, 3 and 4, when I look at the night sky and I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Romans 1, 20, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities. His eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. There are three bedrock assumptions that are made by evolutionists who have given their reasoning for the origins of life. The first one is spontaneous generation. For much of history, people believed that something came from nothing, that a leaf would fall into an ocean or, or into a pond and then that leaf would turn into uh, a, a duck or a stick would fall from a tree in a river and that stick would turn into a snake. But that we know can never truly happen. Louis Pasteur completely obliterated this thought and Webster even calls this dictionary, uh, in Webster's dictionary it says that it has now been abandoned. This is critical. Because this spontaneous generation is one of the bedrock foundations of evolution that was set forth by Darwin himself. When you look at astrophysics, there are 60 criteria that if any one of these were off in our world, there would be no possibility for life on our planet. One of them is if the Earth's rotation was slower or faster. If we were 2% closer or further from the sun. If Earth had a 1% change in its sunlight, if Earth was smaller or larger, life would not exist. If Taco Bell closed at 3 p.m., if the moon was smaller or larger, if we had more than one moon, if the Earth's crust was thinner or thicker, if oxygen-nitrogen ratio was greater or less, or if the ozone layer was greater or less, life could not exist depend, uh, could, could not survive. Dr. George Wald was a Nobel Peace Prize, Peace, Peace Prize winner from Harvard, and he said, one is only to contemplate the magnitude of this task, to concede that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible, yet here we are. And as a result, I believe in spontaneous gen generation. So here he's saying it's impossible, but I believe it Anyway, isn't that exactly what they get mad at creationists about? Yeah. Let's move forward. Some of the greatest evidence that we'll see for God is in the human eye. A million optic nerve endings are left in the center of your brain, head for a million optic nerve endings that your left eye may have, and they meet at the exact partner. One million looking for one million. And when they find their exact partner, you instantly had sight. Experts will tell you that the most techno technologically advanced thing on the planet is your eye. The miracle of the eyelids in your life actually come in about six months of your development. 
The human eye is so complicated that it is an interrelated system of 40 individual subsystems, including the retina, pupil, iris, cornea, lens, and optic nerve. And to give you an example of why that's important, the retina has approximately 137 million special cells that, res that respond to light and send messages into the brain. We are dealing with all the section of your brains that actually even come in and deal with the interpretation of the sight that you see. All these various systems have to work together perfectly in order for you to actually see. And it's because of this incredible complexity. Well, Charles Darwin himself even said, to suppose that the eye with all of its in imitable contrivances for adjusting to focus and different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have formed by natural selection seems, I freely con confess, absurd in the highest degree possible. What does that mean? When you look at what the eye can do, even Charles Darwin says it is not possible for it to just happen. So you have the founder, father of evolution saying it is impossible. It's a shame that people don't talk about that as much. Let's take a look and see exactly how complex your hand actually is. Let's go ahead and play that video. Perhaps no tool in the world is as versatile and useful as the human hand. Its details constantly display real design. For example, finger bone lengths follow the proportions of the Fibonacci number sequence. The sum of the smallest two segments of a finger equals the length of the third, and the sum of the second and third equals the length of the fourth bone. Your hand is a mobile golden spiral, perfectly balancing strength and dexterity. Also, extended fingers squeezed against one another show the offset knuckles meshing. If knuckles lined up, they'd rub uncomfortably and space fingers too far apart. Muscles that control the hand actually reside in the forearm instead of the palm, leaving space to hold an object or another person's hand. A large amount of your brain is dedicated to controlling hand muscles. This means that grip control combinations are nearly infinite and remarkably versatile. For example, a construction worker can easily curl three fingers around a bucket handle in a loose endurance grip. At the same time, his thumb can press a note card tight to his index finger while his pinky hooks a plastic sack. Simultaneously, his other hand can curl its last three fingers and press the palm firm over the fingertips locked in a power grip to carry a heavy hammer while the thumb and index finger gently pluck up a potato chip without crushing it. And how do people type so fast? The brain plans finger movements three actions ahead of time. Intervals between keystrokes are often as brief as 60 thousandths of a second. So it makes sense for the Lord Jesus to use the skill, strength, and awesome connecting power of our hands to express his love. He promises that his hands will guide, uphold, and faithfully keep his own in his powerful grip. And evolutions would want you to think that that just happened by chance. What they'll tell you is the second bedrock of what they believe, and that is in mutations. I'm not talking about the X-Men. However, it is the same principle that over time, the genetically involved, they mutate. There is a mutant gene, which may indicate why some people have one blue eye, one brown eye. Or maybe somebody is born with an additional finger. All those are mutations that they claim just happen over time. And as the mut mutation is beneficial for the next level of their development, the stronger mutations take hold and the weaker mutations drop off. The problem with that is that means that nothing is fixed. That actually really is an eye. It's a real eye. That means that nothing is fixed. Everything should be in a constant state of evolution. If that were the case, then there would be fossil records and animals to this day that are, in, that are right now in that state of transition. To them, uh, it makes sense that um, 
an amoeba turned into an invertebrate, which became an amphibian, then a reptile, then an ape, and finally a man. However, there has been no evidence whatsoever in the fossil record that shows any of these in that transitional state. What we do have is not um, that macroevolution. We do have natural selection and a microevolution. And it doesn't change the species. Let's look at the next slide. Evolution would want you to say that one cell turned into an octopus, a bat, and a turtle. Where micro says, you may have a sheep, it may all of a sudden have darker fur, it may have lighter fur, it may have bigger horns or not. But it's not changing what it really is. Do you understand? It's still a sheep. It still is what it is. And that's important because Genesis 1.25 said, God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. That word kind actually refers to the species. And it keeps it from drifting. So when Noah took the animals on the ark, he did not have to take a Rottweiler, a pit bull, a chihuahua, Come on, you didn't have to do all those things. In the genetic code of those animals, and because of selective breeding, we've been able to make offshoots. But a dog is a dog is a dog. A cat is a cat is a cat. A person is a person. Now they would tell you that because of interbreeding, that we eventually became from monkeys. But even monkeys don't interbreed with themselves. Okay? So it does not work. They have been looking for a common ancestor, and I figured this is the best picture of a common ancestor, if you remembered the movie Harry and the Hendersons. But they have not found any sort of a missing link. Even there was a special tooth that they found of a Neanderthal in Nebraska that they said was a Neanderthal tooth. They found out that it was just the tooth that had been taken out of his pig in the next stall. You have to be careful when you think, oh, they found this skeleton. Because what they won't tell you is that they found part of the skeleton here, and 20 miles away they found another piece of the skeleton. They're finding that with dinosaurs. They're not getting complete dinosaur bones, and so they're taking heads that they find in one dig, traveling to another state and sticking it on the head of another animal they may have found. So even the animals that you think you see never really existed for the most part. Darwin confessed that there are two or three million species on Earth, a sufficient field, one might think, for observation. But it must be said today that in spite of all the evidence of trained observers, not one change of the species to another is on record. That was Darwin. Charles Singer once wrote a short history of science in the 19th century that evolution is perhaps unique among major scientific theories in that the appeal to its evidence is not that there is any evidence for it. Now, now that we got our mutations down, and we're talking about the Big Bang Theory and all that, I do want to talk about Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens shows us uh, what it looks like when scientists are actually looking at the strata layer. This is Mount St. Helens before it blew up. Speaking to my friend who actually was there during that time, he remembers the sky growing black. He remembers the, the damage that was done, even to the lungs and things. This was a traumatic time in his life that he remembers as a child. But what happened at Mount St. Helens actually gives us proof on how the Grand Canyon could have been formed in a very short amount of time. Would you like to know how that works? Ruben, hit that video. On May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens, located 95 miles south of Seattle, Washington, erupted. The eruption was triggered by an earthquake centered beneath the mountain that measured 5.1 on the Richter scale. The lateral blast swept out the north side of Mount St. Helens at 300 miles per hour, with temperatures as high as 660 degrees Fahrenheit and the power of 24 megatons of thermal energy, it snapped 100-year-old trees like toothpicks and stripped them of their bark. 
before the famous eruption at Mount St. Helens, scientists were mostly familiar with slow-acting examples of geologic change. But at Mount St. Helens, geologists watched the Earth's surface change quite rapidly. Icebergs were buried in hot avalanche material. They melted and formed badlands in days. Eruptions on May 18 and June 10 produced fine layers in hours. On June 10, mud flows cut zigzag canyons 100 feet deep in soft sand and mud, complete with perpendicular side canyons, canyons that are reminiscent of the geography of Grand Canyon, only 40 times smaller and clearly produced within hours. Mud flows over the following decade cut hundreds of feet into solid rock in just days of cutting time. Fallen trees formed a log mat on the surface of Spirit Lake and dropped bark to the bottom of the lake, accumulating up to three feet of bark peat in just a couple years. And vertically floating logs sinking to the bottom of the lake resulted in buried trees in only a decade, similar to the trees of Yellowstone's fossil forest, which are also buried in volcanic layers. Even though Mount St. Helens is a very small catastrophe compared to the flood, or the major catastrophes immediately following the flood, it provides a better clue to what happened in those times than the slow geologic processes which are most commonly seen in the present. This just shows it could have been done with the flood like that. It's pretty interesting when you look at it. And this is important because we're going to talk about now the mystery of the empty strata layers. This is when we're actually dealing with the different layers in the sediment that you see typically when somebody's making a road, on the, cutting through a mountain, and you can see the different layers going up. As you dig through it, they have different names for the strata, and, and especially when you actually look at something like the Grand Canyon. They have one layer that's called the Mississippi, one that's called the Devonian, and then the Cambrian, and it keeps going on more and more. What they're having a hard time saying, though, is that over the course of millions of years, so you can see the different layers and the different lines, the different coloring, that's the different layers of the rock where Mount St. Helens just showed could be formed very, very quickly, even with the perpendicular lines in a matter of days, right? Show the next slide. This is what they would have you believe as far as what it takes. 270 million years old, 300, 340, 505 million years. They would say that it took that long to create that. However, we do know that it only took a matter of days to cut hundreds of feet through the sides of the mountain at Mount St. Helens. Very, very important, especially if you are a young person in your science classes, to have this information because they're going to be trying to indoctrinate you with bad things. Now, what's important, what I want to focus on, is something called the Cambrian Explosion. This is the layer that they say is several million uh, years, you know, 300 million years down. And the problem that they have with the fossil layer in the Cambrian strata is that that is where the bulk of life really is. Nothing below it. So when they're dealing with their fossils, they would see, think that if things evolved over millions of years, then immediately below, well, we can obviously tell what they are, there should be some lower life forms or forms in transition. The problem is they have not found one of these in that layer. And it really has a big problem because they don't know what to do with it. In fact, uh, Daniel... Axelrod of the University of California says one of the major unsolved problems of geology and evolution is this Cambrian layer. They have no answer for it. All of a sudden life showed up pretty much the way it looks today. George Gaylord Simpson, who is known as the crown prince of evolution, said... The sudden appearance of life is not only the most puzzling feature of the whole fossil record, but it's also the greatest apparent inadequacy. He wrote that in the evolution of life. 
So here are evolutionists that are saying, at one point in history, life showed up, and that is the hardest thing that we have to prove it otherwise. Time Magazine decided to run with this picture and wrote an article on this very thought, where it says, evolution's Big Bang. New discoveries show that life as we know it began in an amazing biological frenzy that changed the planet almost overnight. <coughs> Secular magazines. So what does that mean for us? It means that they don't even agree with themselves. It means that they have no idea. They get mad at us because we believe in faith. They believe in us and say that we don't have any science that back what we do. However, other than a couple cute pictures, they've got nothing. They don't have any bones or anything like that. Well, but the, but the dinosaurs lived millions and millions of years ago. Okay, Ruben, show that next picture that looks kind of strange. You probably don't even know what it is. Huh. This was uncovered in Texas by Dr. Carl Baugh from the Creation Institute. Human tracks next to dinosaur tracks in the same level. How did that happen? Is that in history? Well, at one point they called them dragons. Some people call them great lizards. The Bible talks about them. We just call them dinosaurs. We have so much evidence that they coexisted, it's not even funny. And if you go to some of the missionaries in Papua New Guinea, some of our own Assemblies of God missionaries discuss things that I will save at a later time. So what am I saying by the time you get done with all this? Well, Sir Frederick Hoyle, the famous British astronomer and agnostic, said, The current scenario of the origin of life is about as likely as a tornado passing through a junkyard beside a Boeing airplane company and accidentally producing a 747. An agnostic said that. Sir Francis Crick wrote in the Scientific American, The origin of life appears to be almost a miracle. So many are the conditions that would have to be satisfied to get it going. And I want to conclude with Darwin, who said, I was a young man with unformed ideas. I threw out queries, suggestions, wondering all the time over everything, and to my astonishment, the ideas took like wildfire. People made a religion out of them. Friends, creation versus evolution is very, very important. Because evolution teaches us that we are nothing more than evolved animals. As such, then it truly is survival of the fittest. I can walk up to anybody and blow their brains out. Why? Because it's survival of the fittest. There is no moral framework to anything. I can lie. I can cheat. I can steal. Because we are nothing more than animals. And it is survival of the fittest. So we cannot. Ignore the fact that when you have a God who created us in his image, we must act like we were created in the image of God. And we also need to know that when you have atheists who think that they're nothing but animals, we should not be shocked if that's what they act like. Come on. But we know that God created all things. Shalom, if you will come back and get ready for the last one. Evolution says life is chance. Creation says God created with intelligence and design. Evolution says you're just an overgrown ape. But creation says you were made in the image of God. Evolution can't place any value or proof of love. Creation said God loves beauty and love is meaningful and he is love. Evolution states survival of the fittest. The creation and scripture reveal that God looks out for the weak, the broken, and the hurting. Evolution says Jesus is a fraud. But the Bible says that he created us and wants to recreate you. Evolution is based on faith and science. Creation is based on faith and science. But they are drastically worlds apart. I want to play one last video for you. This is going to be unique. This is a set up by a pastor, a preacher by the name of Louis Giglio, who did a wonderful, wonderful work on some of this stuff. And he has some stars from 47 Tuck. He has the Vela Pole star that we played. There's another one that he's going to play. And he actually merges it with a whale. And the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. 
the Bible talks about the rocks crying out to him. Have you ever wondered if God, well, you ever wondered what he hears every day from this praising creation? I mean, here we are creating his image. How did you praise him when we had the opportunity? Did you sing? Did you not sing? What would it look like if we combined all of creation, worshiping God at the same time? Would you like to hear it? Yeah. Ruben, play this last video. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all deeps. The, the whale songs could sound like this right here. Take a listen. We don't know the expanse of the worship that is continually surrounding the throne of God. And our songs are great, but God isn't banking on our songs because He is surrounded by a symphony that's bigger than our wildest dreams tonight. Stars sing and whales sing and the birds fly. And I just tried to imagine what would it sound like if you could just for a second be God and hear what He hears. And I can't get us there tonight, but I, I came close. I had a friend who helped me with this little iPad program. And, and I'm not a DJ, but I, I just a, a little thing, just quickly, and I, I want you to see how this works. Now, this guy, we didn't look at his picture. He's PSR BO329-54. And he's only rotating one and a half times per second, which is not all that much, but we need him in our little experiment we're going to do here, okay? Um, and then we had the Vela Pulsar. You remember the Vela Pulsar, right? So that's that guy. That's a little too fast for what we're trying to do, so we're going to slow that down, okay? And so we're going to put the, uh, the millisecond guys in there, the ones you just heard, here they come.
time, just you and the whales. Just you and the whales. I love that because all that you heard the music, that was all. That was the stars, man. That was the stars being rhythm. That was the whales. Sometimes I sound like a whale singing. That's okay. God is a great God. I just want to conclude today singing that song. Because God is great. And if you missed that, you missed everything.